Hey, indie filmmakers, I'm Griffin Hammond, and on this week's episode, we are talking about taxes and freelancing, how to save money and handle your finances as a freelancer. Plus, we're answering your questions about compressing video files for the internet, focusing effectively, and convincing people to be in your documentary films. So, Adam, <laughs> you are not Nick. I am not, no, no. <laughs> this is my friend, Adam Ron. Uh, I am, we are in Bloomington, actually we're in Normal, Illinois right now. Splitting hairs at this point. Yeah. yeah. Bloomington, Normal, Illinois. Blono. Uh, this is where we went to school and Adam is a college friend of mine. Yeah. Yeah. We, uh, um, we went through the TV program here together. Uh, yeah. I have fond memories of, uh, we have the same water bottle when we were at TV 10 <laughs> together, um, I believe. Uh, and, uh, yeah, we just, we've kept in touch and then. I try to see you when you come back into town, you yeah. know, from uh, when you're in Bahrain or wherever. <laughs> so we're actually, we're in the basement of Fell Hall uh, at our at our alma mater. This is where TV10 is. We're actually in the WZND studio right now. You can listen to this radio station at 103.3 when you're in Bloomington and Normal. And Adam is the perfect guy to have here today. One, Nick just had like something come up at the last minute. He couldn't be on the show today. But you are actually a freelance video professional here. I am, yeah. So That's this correct. is like the exact perfect person to talk about sure. what we're talking about today. Yeah. Uh, before we get into how we deal with finances in freelancing and taxes, I do just want to mention two things uh, that are going on with me that I'm excited about. Yeah. One is I just found out there's a Wikipedia article about me. <laughs> <laughs> of course. Somewhere Nick is rolling his eyes. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I, I did not know there was. Like someone made it back in sure. February. Uh, I'm saying this one because it's not entirely accurate. So like, and you're not supposed Nothing on Wikipedia. <laughs> you're not supposed to edit your own Wikipedia oh, stuff. Oh, I didn't know that. That's like a, a breach of <laughs> yeah. yeah. Oh. So anyone out there that knows anything about me, please <laughs> go, I know th- I know go add things. Go add the right things, I guess. Yeah. <laughs> Two, I'm here for, for Com Week yeah. this week. Uh, it's like they bring in all these professionals and alums. And so I'm actually giving a speech uh, today at 2 p.m., and then I'm going to be part of a documentary film festival at uh, 7 p.m. tonight. But they also, a couple of days ago, gave me an award for, like, like young alum, <laughs> outstanding work. <laughs> Most handsome alum ever, <laughs> probably. <laughs> so really excited to be back here yeah. on campus. Yeah, I'm so excited I never left campus, essentially. Yeah. I've just been here for the past... 14 years. <laughs> yeah. And you've actually worked on campus at ISU as like in university marketing, right? Yeah. Yeah. So uh, up until about uh, October of last year, I worked for uh, university marketing and communications here on campus. And uh, we just did all the promotional stuff for um, anything you see that promotes the university. Yeah. Um, other than athletics, athletics has its own kind of thing. Uh, yeah. But uh, yeah, so I'm very well versed in, in all the, all the, marketing and the university culture and stuff yeah. like that. It's, it was actually kind of hard to get out of it, to be honest, when, yeah. when I stopped. Well, and you know. what gave you like the bravery to go 100% freelance? Um, so I had been uh, in that role for several years uh, through, um, I had started as a graduate assistant and then just kind of worked my way into a full-time job uh, and then into um, not even like middle, middle management, if that. And um, in certain organizations, there's just only so high you can go. Um, and uh, I kind of just done everything I could do at that department. Yeah. And uh, I had had uh, three or four really, really nice freelance projects come up. Um, uh, one with uh, an international airline, uh, a couple with um, some really big nonprofits um, that operate in the US. and. I just kind of looked at my finances and was like, I bet I could make a go of it. Yeah. Um, and, yeah it's a uh, lot easier when like some good projects come along yeah. and you're not just like, today's the day I'm going to start being a freelancer yeah. and I'm going to have to start cold calling. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> it was, uh, it was four or five months kind of in, in the thinking. Uh, but it just kind of came about really quick because I had some projects come up, some really nice ones. And yeah. I just was like, there's not going to be a better time. Yeah. Um, if I take vacation time, I won't get, you know, maybe paid out for vacation later on if I quit. Uh, and it's one of those things where if I don't do it, I know myself and it would be three years from now and I'd yeah. still be like, next week, next week I'll figure <laughs> it or six months in six months. Yeah. So uh, yeah, and it just, it happened to work out really well. And um, I was fortunate enough to have a position um, where I could work on freelance 
in addition to my own, um, you know, full-time job. Yeah. Uh, and so I've been building up a client base here in town and around yeah. the region for almost a decade now. Yeah. It's very similar um, to what I was doing when yeah. I was here. Yeah. And like working jobs, but also doing freelance on the side. Yeah, exactly. And then I went full-time freelance in like 2014, mm -hmm. right after, that was right after like Sriracha came out. It was right after my job with Indie Mogul ended. Mm -hmm. And it felt like a great time to do freelance. And then when I actually started looking at my finances, realized it feels like I'm making a lot of money. Like each project made a lot of money, yeah. but you spend so much time prepping projects yeah. and like emailing people that mm -hmm. in the end I wasn't making as much. It was I, it was hard. Yeah. Uh, so I have a, a, a huge spreadsheet. I'm like a former mathlete, yeah. you know, state ranked mathlete from when I was a kid. <laughs> really? and, yeah. And um, and uh, my wife is rolling her eyes now somewhere now. They say this. Uh, <laughs> So I've got, you know, spreadsheets of, I keep track of, you know, all the pennies in and out um, and all the time that I spend, mileage, all this other stuff. And when you boil it down, I look at what I make hourly or what I charge hourly and it's, I'm like, oh, that's good. Yeah. And then you look at all your non-billable hours. So finding clients, sending emails, working on projects, working on contracts, working on price quotes, yeah. um, sending out invoices, all the other stuff that it takes to run a business. Yeah. Sometimes you're just and like you're, going on coffee meetings yeah. with a client. Yeah. And, and I don't, you know, I don't charge yeah, for, don't charge for an that. hour to go get a coffee. And... Uh, yeah, and, and so your hourly rate ends up be, being a third or even yeah, less right. yeah. than what you normally would. Um, yeah, I often thought like my freelance rate almost needs to be like four times what a salary job would be. Yeah. Like in New York, you know, I charge $200 an hour mm -hmm. for freelance. And I think, you know, maybe my salary was only like $50 an hour, which is great. Yeah. But like your freelance rate needs to be so much bigger because of that gap. Yeah, and that was uh, about what mine uh, works out to be compared to what I made hourly or what I you know made as a salaried employee and now what I make. Um, and if you could work full time, I would just be, you know, I would be so rich I wouldn't know what to do with myself. Right. You know, yeah. <laughs> which is yeah, you know, full time job gives all those like guarantees of like even if there's no work, you still get you paid. still go into the office. Yeah, yeah you still get paid. So yeah. there's that nice um, guarantee. Yeah. So that's uh, that was kind of a big thing to to take into consideration and and that was one I think I'd been I had known. Um, you know, years before and, yeah. um, you know, partially probably in the fact that you and I had always talked about talked about doing freelance stuff. So I knew kind of what it would take. And, um, you know, if you're making $20 an hour at your salary job, you can't survive off that, you know, unless you work yeah. 12 or 14 hours a day, which is unsustainable. Yeah. So you've got to go above and beyond that for your, yeah. um, for your stuff, for, you know, for retirement, for taxes, right. um, you know, buying your own gear and stuff like that. So yeah. both you and I, make freelance income we spend money on yes. equipment yeah we have to pay taxes to the government so we actually have a lot of questions uh that we've been putting off sure. uh, for about taxes um we haven't answered them on the podcast yet but this is the perfect day to to answer them because yes. yesterday was tax day uh so today we can really look forward to paying our taxes for yeah. 2017. we look forward to it so much <laughs> so here let's start with a question that we sure. got from chris um he just completed his taxes, and he's wondering, one, do we set up an LLC, or are we just a sole proprietor, and then do we have any tips for writing off our expenses? So are you an LLC? You, your company is Droy Media. Yeah, so uh, I run a company, Droy Media, and this has gone through, you know, I operated with a name for like six years, yeah. and I didn't, I never incorporated or anything. Yeah. And then uh, I, my wife and I work really well together, and we found out that when, we, when I started doing freelance, um, she's a great script writer and yeah. conceptualizes a bunch of projects and stuff. So she handles that part of the project. And then I do the, I just show up with a camera and yeah. shoot. And then I do some editing. And um, so we are actually a 50-50 uh, split LLC. So we're a partnership okay. LLC. Um, I don't know anything about LLCs. Like, did you have to go talk to a lawyer? Did you do this on the internet or you something? You can do both. So there are like, I think maybe like LegalZoom or a couple other online places will walk you through the yeah. process. It's real easy. Um, and for that, do you, you pay them like a... An extra fee. Yeah. You pay um, them like a one-time fee or it's like a yes. monthly subscription? Yeah, um, uh, a one-time fee, I believe. And then every year, I believe every year you have to re-register with the state. Okay. Um, for a, it's not the same amount. It's like a nominal or, you know, a much smaller fee. Yeah. So I have some friends in town that have not freelance video production businesses, but they run similar small businesses. Yeah. Um, when you look at it, small businesses are all kind of the same yeah. um, or can be. They have the same issues, challenges, solutions, and stuff like that. 
So I talked to them. Uh, I talked to an accountant who said that that would probably be our best bet yeah. um, in the way we run it. Uh, and then that way, um, it's split between the two of us. We have a little more options when yeah. it comes to filing taxes and things like that. So, so uh, referencing yeah. Chris's question, he also yeah. mentioned sole proprietorship. Mm -hmm. And that's what I do. Sure. I just work by myself. I call myself my, you know, when people ask me, like, what is your business? Is it incorporated? Yeah. And I just say, oh, no, it's just a sole proprietorship, which just means it's me. It's my social security number yeah. that I give people. Uh, if they need to pay me, mm -hmm. and it's it's easy. Yeah. You just it's you can you can file this on your taxes just as a person. Sure. What I've never understood is a lot of people, especially when they make films, they go out and make like an LLC. Mm -hmm. I don't even know enough to know, like, what is the risk to me by not being an LLC? I'm not sure. Yeah. I think that I mean it, I know that it's it's an LLC stands for Limited Liability Corporation. Yes. Yeah. And so I get the sense that there is some like protection from being sued. Like you're separating yeah. yourself from your company. I think that's the case. So if you're even if you're not making a film, like if your camera falls and bumps me in the head, yeah. and I decide to be a jerk and sue you, yeah. um, you're suing the LLC or suing the LLC. Griffin. Yeah. So I don't I don't have access to to all of you, like what my you own. retirement savings. Yeah, yeah. I just have access to your company. Yeah. Um, so it's a, I guess a good way to keep it separate. Yeah. And that's. From my understanding, that's about the only reason. So does the company have its own money then that's like like you, separate from your savings? Yeah, so I've yeah. got a separate bank account that's got, okay. you know, when you look Do online. Do you have to like pay yourself from the LLC? Um, I don't. Typically, I just I'll put it in there and then when I need it, I'll withdraw it for um, uh, for when I pay taxes. Yeah. <laughs> um, when I uh, purchase equipment, um, you know, occasionally if I'm out with a client grabbing coffee, I'll use it then. Yeah. Um, and then uh, I believe you can start. I could withdraw all of the money at any time. Yeah. I mean, it's it's mine. It's it ours. Belongs it belongs okay. to me. Um, I believe you draw salaries when you're uh, like an S corp, which is a whole yeah. different. I don't even. Yeah. I don't know what that means. <laughs> I don't know what the S stands for. Um, but uh, I've got some friends in town that do. Uh, he does web design and he's an S corp. So yeah. he draws a, a and salary you don't have from employees. That. No, like it's, it's just you two. Just us two. Because that seems like it would get complicated yeah. too. You add employees and then. You need to like do payroll taxes and yeah, I, offer benefits, and you, and then you have to keep track of everyone's W twos or W nines yeah. that they fill out and give to you, and it's it's yeah. a whole hassle. So, uh, occasionally, I will have a subcontractor come in and help for a shoot or something like that. But um, a lot of times, uh, you know, I just use one of the free online or the really inexpensive online tax services right now, and it just walks you through. Yeah, you know that kind of information. Yeah, um, yeah. I just use TurboTax. Yes, to, to yeah. do my taxes. Same here. I actually went to, like, when I moved to New York, I was thinking, like, man, my taxes are starting to get complicated. Like, sure. I have all this different income, and weird situations. So maybe now it's time to go to a tax professional. Uh, and I went to like an H and R Block, mm -hmm. and for some reason they just like put it off, and they never did it. They finally, I finally just like did it myself on TurboTax overnight, and I came in the next morning like on tax day, and I was like, uh, I did my taxes, I don't need you anymore. And they were like, oh, they were mad about this, but I was like, you didn't do it. Yeah. <laughs> they were probably using TurboTax too. Yeah. <laughs> but I realized like it's not hard. Like yeah. TurboTax walks you through all of it. Absolutely, it's so easy. The only difference between like are they being... the new sponsor of the episode? No. <laughs> hey, Andy Filmmakers yeah. brought to you. <laughs> brought to you by Intuit, yeah. the company. But actually, I am going to talk about a bunch of Intuit projects, sure. products. Because uh, I use Mint, yeah, yeah, for like tracking my my personal finances. Yeah. I like the little uh, graphs they give you. I use uh, QuickBooks, yes, to track my business expenses, mm -hmm. and I use TurboTax. Yeah, so they're all the same ecosystem. Oh, wow, what a what a broad range of <laughs> products they have for the small business owners. <laughs> but like honestly, your taxes as a freelancer are not too much more complicated. You do your normal personal taxes yep. through TurboTax, and then the only addition is the Schedule C mm -hmm. when you're a business, when you have yep. a business. Yeah. And do you do that with an LLC as well? So I will. Um, the way I structured it, I didn't want to go into the 2016 tax year with having part, um, having to deal with freelance Schedule C and full-time work since I quit about two-thirds yeah. of the way through the year. So I actually had my paperwork go through at the very end of the year. Um, so this year I will start with the Schedule oh, C, okay. the 2017. I'll yeah. start with, uh, I believe that's the quarterly tax yeah. and all the other stuff that comes with that. Um, my accountant knows all of this information. Yeah. <laughs> and I just I told her to tell me when I need to pay the government money. Yeah. And, and otherwise I'll just keep track of it all. Yeah. So, um, so yeah, I, I plan on getting into that a little more this year, uh, but I haven't gotten into the, yeah. the Schedule C style right. 
uh, stuff on my taxes. So at least TurboTax I here. costs more when you do the the Schedule C. There's like a yep, it's like self a, business yep. plan or something. Yeah, it's like an extra fifty bucks or something. But the cool thing is, I do all that in TurboTax, and then it now lets me use QuickBooks mm -hmm. Self Employed for free. It's like yep. included in that. I spend like a maybe a hundred or hundred and fifty dollars to do my taxes mm -hmm. annually, and now that includes this online software where I can track my expenses and my income throughout the year. Yeah, I saw that this uh, this tax season, I saw that that this was uh, it was kind of included in that. I'm yeah. glad I didn't go buy it for like $350 right. six months ago. Or I, I think it's also available for like $10 or, a month. Or something like that, you yeah. You can get it for free. And yeah, yeah, this is the first year I'm using it. Mm -hmm. But I'm already seeing a nice benefit to using the software. Because if I just flash back real quick to like the first year that I made a bunch of freelance income, mm -hmm. I'm guessing with the government, there's some threshold to once you make enough freelance income, then they start asking you to pay quarterly taxes. Yeah. Because one year I did my taxes and the government was, or TurboTax was like, uh, yeah, you were supposed to be paying estimated taxes yes. this year. You made yeah. too much money that you didn't have withholding on. Mm -hmm. When you have a job, yeah. they take withholding, they take the taxes out throughout the year. Yeah. When you're a freelancer, you're supposed to be paying some money throughout the year. Otherwise, yeah. the government's like, well, you've been keeping this money for it from yeah. us. <laughs> so, yeah, there's like a small penalty. I don't know if it was that bad. I I just got um, – this last year, I had uh, thankfully had a very good year for yeah. freelance, and it was the same. They they went in it. I don't quote me on this. I think it was like four bucks a quarter or something like that. Yeah. So it was like sixteen bucks for the, the year. The penalty was. Yeah. Yeah. I feel like I was. paid like thirty dollars as a penalty. Or yeah. Something. It so wasn't too bad. It wasn't horrible. Um, so that's again what I hope to get into this year. So I'm not incurring. Yeah. You know. I mean, if it's thirty bucks a year for ten years, it's still not a ton of money. But um, I just, you know, as a small business owner, I don't need to hassle with an audit or anything right. like that. Yeah. You know, I want to do everything as as good as I can to the best of my ability, yeah. to the best of my knowledge. Um, so yeah, I'm gonna start doing the quarterly stuff, and um, as you know, with freelance money, not everything comes in equally throughout the year. No. So I'm gonna have like a a June where I'm gonna owe in taxes, and yeah. I'm gonna be eating rice and beans for like three <laughs> weeks or something. You know. <laughs> well, it's funny because the so you know you have to pay estimated taxes because the, when they print out your tax return or when you print it out at the mm -hmm. end, uh, it has like a page that's like here are the four vouchers that we, you need to send in over the next year. Oh, sure, sure. And they just estimate it based on your previous year. Mm -hmm. So if you had a really good year, they might be overestimating. And that sure. actually happened to me this year. I paid my quarterly taxes, and at the end of the year, I actually got a big refund because nice. I was essentially overpaying. Yeah. Uh, so this is how you know that you need to pay estimated quarterly taxes. But with QuickBooks now, because I'm telling it exactly what my income is, mm -hmm. And I'm telling it exactly what my deductions are, it the knows. expenses that I want to take out. Sure. It's telling me, like, I just paid my, I had to pay, like, $3,000 to the feds mm -hmm. for quarter one. Mm -hmm. So that was yeah. due yesterday. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, I like what we still call them the feds. The feds. Yeah. Yeah. Well, because then you also have to pay your quarterly taxes to the New state. York State. Yeah. And I owe them $1,000. Yeah. It's so I'll do that every quarter, and at the end of the year, we'll kind of reconcile and see, say, did you pay an appropriate Enough, amount? Yeah. And as long as it's in that uh, threshold, as long as mm -hmm. it's like, it's I think it's less than, it can't, there's like a 20% window. Like it can't yeah. be like 10% less than you owed. Yeah. Like, it shouldn't be 10% more than you owed. Yeah. I would imagine if I, if you just took me and implanted me into like New York, that I would fall way below the threshold, you know? And yeah, then maybe, for yeah. Illinois, if you just came in Illinois for, you know, what your freelance rate was, you would probably fall above it and the government would be like, we need to know what you're, you know, making yeah. constantly. Yeah. Um, but yeah, I'm not sure what that what that is, but that's uh, I'll call it looking forward to it <laughs> yeah. this year. Um, but yeah, I'm I'm looking forward to actually using QuickBooks too, and in, in making sure that I just have like a spreadsheet now, yeah, uh, which is fine for me. Um, but you know, keeping it on the up and up, and and making sure that there's a professional service that's tracking all of my money is yeah, you know, a peace of mind that I'm happy to. I like that you use. mentioned keeping it on the up and up because. Uh, we got an email from Dakota, mm -hmm. who was just asking, like, do you have to pay taxes uh, on the income that you get from freelancing? And he says he feels like maybe you don't need to because this is freelancing and it's not like a major production. Sure, but I don't know. I pay I pay taxes on all my yeah all my I, income. Um, Dakota, uh, I, f I feel you. Um, <laughs> paying taxes, uh, and I'm like a bleeding heart liberal sometimes, and um, I love paying taxes. I love what it gets me. Yeah. Um, 
Uh, but you, as far as I know, I pay taxes on like every single penny that comes into my door. Uh, and I keep track of, um, of everything I do. And yeah, there are certain jobs where you get paid just 50 bucks, you know, cash or something like that. And, um, I don't want anyone reporting it on their end and then it coming back to me right. and doing it. Um, you know, a lot of times, yeah, even clearly if it's, people do, you know, some things yeah. are cash only and some people, I know some people do not report all Everything. of their income. Yeah. But I, yeah, we, and, I think we agree that we try to keep it all yeah. honest. And yeah. So, uh, as legal as we can be. <laughs> well, and, and so some of the stuff does get reported to the government, not every payment, but I right. know that the threshold is any payment made to you as a freelancer that's over $600, yep. that person is supposed to file what's called a 1099 miscellaneous. Yep. Mm -hmm. And it, it arrives to you in the form of spring of every yeah. year. Mm -hmm. uh, and that's how, you know, if you have a job, you, you submit your W-2s to sure. the government with your taxes. Uh, if you're a freelancer, you're getting a bunch of 1099 miscellaneous. Yeah, you have like a huge stack of them and you yeah. go through them. But what I find is not everyone sends me one. Even the people that have paid me $1,000 mm -hmm. or $1,500, yeah. sometimes those people just don't send me a 1099. Yeah. Um, but I still plug all that in yep. and let the government know I got this money. Yeah. Uh, the nice thing with um, uh, TurboTax, and I, re I noticed it this year, is that if I entered the business name, because it'll say, hey, what business paid you this amount of money, yeah. even if you don't have a 1099, they'll search a database and pull in the employer identification number or yeah. federal employee, what, you know, whatever number it needs. Um, so it's, it's registering as, you know, like a, they're saying like, Hey, we get it. We know that they paid you. Um, and yeah, I, I've run into the same thing where I don't get a 1099 for every gig I do. Right. Um, and, uh, I've, uh, a, an old mentor of mine used to have a system worked out where if it was going to be more, if he was going to make more if $599 because that fell under the threshold, was more than he would make if he, taxes got taken out. He would just cut deals with the people to have $599. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, and I just, this minute I heard that, I was like, that's not, <laughs> it's too yeah. much for me. Um, you know, I, I, I can't, I don't even think I could like fib at all. Yeah. You know, if, if I were to get audited, I would crack under pressure. You know, even if the yeah. IRS called me and said, <laughs> hey, you know, I'd be like, okay, I did, you know. Um, so I just, I mean, I just, I can't imagine not paying on it. Yeah. And the peace of mind that you get, um, Dakota, <laughs> wherever you are listening, um, far outweighs any amount of, any monetary value that you're yeah. going to bring in. And taxes um, suck, but it does feel kind of like it's legitimizing your business when you're sure. like, I actually made money on this yeah, thing. That's great. Absolutely. I made a profit. Wonderful. Yeah. And I'm going to do my... Yeah citizen duty and yeah. pay taxes on it. And and I went full bore this year. I I registered as an LLC. Um, you know, I got a business bank account. I registered with like the Chamber of Commerce in my area, <laughs> with the county um, and with the town that I work out of primarily. Yeah. So, you know, I've got a bunch of, no one cares. I've got a bunch of plaques sitting on my wall that say, oh, has right, Adam Ron has right to do business. Real business. <laughs> yeah, it says real business. It's got like a little teddy bear sticker in the bottom of it. I think they give them to kids too. Um, <laughs> But uh, yeah, it just, it, you do, there's a, a really, really, there's a pride almost that you yeah. get from being a legitimate business and knowing that you're part of this like ecosystem. Um, and at no point in time is anyone ever gonna be able to come back to me and go, you know what, you're not an official business. Um, I've lost projects because I haven't been an official registered wow. LLC. Um, you know, a larger um, entity, like a hospital or something like that, they're not gonna do business with someone that's not registered and on the books because they yeah. have to do everything. You know, they probably get audited every year just as a precaution because they see tens of millions of dollars or whatever. And yeah. um, so it's just, it's I, I've seen no, I see no benefit from not doing it, yeah. frankly. And that sets up our last tax question pretty well. Is, sure. Uh, we got this question from, from Jay. He was talking about, a while back I was talking about my Kickstarter expenses and sure. like deducting those. So he was just wondering, how do you avoid taxes on Kickstarter earnings uh, and I think that just gets into like deducting expenses. Yeah. So like I did pay taxes on the, mm -hmm. what did I make? I made like $21,000 on Kickstarter when sure. I made the Sriracha document. Right. So I I report that to the government, but also they report it to the government. They send a mm -hmm. 1099 that says we paid Griffin Hammond 21. Yeah. Actually they take their cut. So the sure. it's like yeah. we paid him $18,000. Yeah. <laughs> but a lot of that, uh, led to expenses. I mean, the film itself cost twelve thousand dollars. I'm I spent another like six thousand dollars on Blu-rays and stuff. Mm -hmm. So I just itemized those deductions on my Schedule C. You know, TurboTax asks you, "What did you spend money on this yep. year?" And it's like, well, I spent two hundred dollars to order DVDs. That's a 
maybe that was an office expense. Yeah. I can't remember all the categories. They walk you through it too, yeah. which is nice. So I do all that. And in the end, what's the actual profit there? It was like, I mean, at, at the beginning, the profit might have been zero because I had so many expenses. Sure. Yeah. But, you know, I'm only paying the taxes on the profit. So mm-hmm. if I made $2,000 from that, I paid $2,000 or taxes you know, on that. Yeah. yeah. Five hundred dollars or something in like taxes. Yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. I just assume a third of whatever I bring in is yeah. game for taxes. Yeah. Um. And uh, and I've never done any Kickstarter projects, so that's like a whole realm I'm not yeah. familiar but with. It's but it's just normal income. It's just like if a yeah. person paid you. Yeah. And and I think people have this big scary, like taxes, and they don't know much about it. I think there's um. You know, it's not that we're uneducated. It's just that we, you know, it's something that you don't learn it in school at all. Yeah. You know, I mean, they'll teach you how to like identify plants and then they're like well no 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 you don't need to worry about your finances <laughs> like that makes any sense um so then you're in the real world and you have to all of a sudden navigate this weird kind of it's not scary it's just kind of unknown yeah um and there's nothing different to it than like i mean businesses all over the world have been doing this for decades yeah. you know or more um and it's just kind of throwing yourself out there and you know admitting that you've like, I probably don't know everything there is to know about yeah. it. Let me learn about it. Yeah. Um, and Just that was, like with filmmaking, yeah. you can like Google how to do something in Adobe After yeah. Effects. You can Google how to do your taxes. Absolutely. Like yeah. I hope people recognize that taxes for their business are just as accessible. Yeah. You oh, can yeah. handle it. I was literally Googling on the last day the taxes were due how to do something, yeah. you know, how to put like a bank account number in or something like that for yeah. my, to, for the, to withdraw money from my account. Um, and there's, hundreds or thousands of responses online, you yeah. know, when you Google it or search it or whatever. Um, but I just think people are unfamiliar with it and they just get kind of scared yeah. with, you know, how do I avoid expenses and all, you know, some of these other things. And, yeah. um, and I mean, the terminology is its own kind of, you know, like with any industry, the terminology is kind of scary. Yeah. You don't know anything about it. And I thought for the last few years that I've been doing a pretty good job of, of tracking all my expenses. Like mm-hmm. I was keeping a spreadsheet right. where I was just doing that. I like QuickBooks, though, because it pulls in your actual, all of your transactions from your credit card. Mm-hmm. And I noticed pretty quickly, just doing this for one quarter now, that there were a lot of things I was missing. Sure. That, like, I think about the normal things. Like, of course, I'm deducting my equipment that I'm buying. Right. New lights, new camera, all that mm-hmm. stuff. I'm deducting... When you're not getting stuff for, for free. Right, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I'm deducting the cost of travel, you know, sure. plane tickets when I'm going on business. Not when I'm going on vacation, but right. when I'm going on business mm-hmm. trips. But then I was missing just little things like... I would forget to do like that taxi that I took to get to a freelance yep. project or that uh, bottle of water that I, yeah. you know, is essentially a meal on a, on a work trip. Yeah. Those ones add up for me. Yeah. Uh, and I, and I keep, you know, I try to keep all my receipts or, you know, I at least go back online and remember why I look at the amount and, yeah. um, but those ones add up because you just don't think of it in the heat of yeah. the moment or if you're, you know, you run in to grab gas and then you grab like yeah. a Gatorade or something and then you come back out and you spent two bucks on this Gatorade. Right. Essentially, anything a you, year. you spend money on for a project, yes. you you can get like that 25% discount, your tax yeah. discount back. Yeah. Uh, so, yeah, it's important to track all of it, even yeah. if it seems like a small expense. Yeah. And you can't go out like buying like six packs of beer while you're like out right. on a shoot, you know. And being like, oh, <laughs> Maybe it's a prop. Yeah. <laughs> I did it while I was out filming. There yeah. are some things I've looked up like... I was like, you know, I'm on camera all the time. Does that mean my haircuts? Yeah. <laughs> no, haircuts, no. no. You can just Google that, and the government will say, no haircuts. Yeah. <laughs> Pretty much anything that, like, you would have gotten anyway Normal, yeah. uh, often doesn't count, except for meals. Like, I think yeah. meals on, on trips count. I believe so, yeah. And they have – it might be any, everything but, like, tip, I think. I, I For some reason, I feel like the tips were not included when no. I was – this last, you know, couple of weeks when I was entering taxes in. Um, which is fine. I mean, it's not like the end of the world if I'm, you know, I'm not paying on my tips or something like right. that. Uh, but yeah, meal, most meals. Um, and I think even when you're, you know, entertaining clients too. So if, you know, if I go out, um, you know, and I grab like a couple cups of coffee at a coffee house for me and a potential client, yeah. both of those are covered yeah. from what I understand. Um, that's going to be the thing that gets me audited. Or something, <laughs> you know, <laughs> wait a second, you bought a cup of coffee for someone? <laughs> um, but uh, from my understanding, that you know that sort of yeah. stuff, as long as it's, again, le- a legitimate business e- yeah. expensive. And do you work from home? Yes, yeah. So then I have like a little, I have like the home office deduction. Yeah. So um, That's been really nice in New York because my rent is so expensive. Probably like half of your apartment. <laughs> but the percentage of my apartment, I think it's actually 17% of my yeah. apartment because uh, I have an, an extra bedroom. And that mm-hmm. bedroom is the office. Yeah. That's where I do all my work. Mm-hmm. So I get to deduct that 17% of my rent and 17% of my like utilities. Yeah. 
uh, like cable, some of these other things. Yeah. And um, I use my cell phone almost primarily for business. Yeah. Uh, and that's, again, that, that bill has been a write off. I had a, a we had a three bedroom house and um, my uh, one of our bedrooms was my office for a while and it was like a nice big space for my um, for me to work in and a closet with all my stuff in it. And uh, um, I got moved out of that bedroom, uh, you know, some personal stuff. We're in the process of becoming like foster parents and we were like, all, so we have all these beds and stuff now. So yeah. I'm like in a corner of a living room now, which is great. We've got this nice little like nook next to our fireplace. So it's nice and warm. And um, But I don't get as big of a write off now right. that I'm in like a little corner, yeah. you know. But I mean, I didn't even use like all the space, you know, behind me when I would be sitting in the corner editing in that room. And now I, you know, have less, but it's, uh, but it is nice to, to have that. Um, I mean, it, as a business owner, you have a lot of expenses anyway. So to get a little bit back or for them to, you know, understand that, like, yeah, you're clearly using this space for your business. Yeah. Then you can do it. And um, and I try to work from home as much as possible unless my animals are driving me nuts. Right. And I have to, I just, I got to go. Yeah. <laughs> um, so, yeah. Yeah. So in conclusion, yeah. it sucks to pay taxes. <laughs> yes. <laughs> but I think, I think it's, it's easy to get really hung up on taxes. I think it's, if you just focus on actually saving money in yep. what you do, I mean, still spend... You might think like, oh, if I spend a lot of money, then I can deduct all of that. But you're still losing that money. Yeah. And you're yeah. getting less of it back. I mean, like you're only getting a portion of it back. So I think yeah. still being a frugal person, making as much as you can on the project, yeah. spending as little as you can, that's going to impact your yeah. finances more than how much tax you get back. Yeah, I agree. And uh, and I've had that too. Or at the end of the year, I'll see what kind of I'll kind of like well. Let's say I made thirty grand this year, just as a nice even number. Um, and let's say a third of that I'm expecting to pay for taxes, so I'm expecting yeah. to pay about ten thousand dollars back in taxes. Well, if I can buy ten thousand dollars worth of equipment, that brings my you know income only to twenty. So then my taxes are less. Again, then all of a sudden instead of only getting ten taken away, I'm getting ten that I spend in equipment plus taxes taken away. So I'm seeing less overall. Yeah. Um, so it doesn't really it doesn't really work out if you want to go out and spend a bunch of money or try to buy like a company car or yeah. something like that. It doesn't it doesn't make any sense. You're better off again being frugal and, and looking at it, you know, from a from a business standpoint where, you know, yeah, you love what you do, but you need to do it to make money as well and, yeah. and keeping track of all those expenses and cool. um, and income and stuff like that. Well, in just a moment, we're answering your questions about compressing video files for the internet, how to focus your lens effectively, and convincing people to be part of your documentary project. Hey, Indie Filmmakers is brought to you by, I don't know, we don't have a sponsor this week, but uh, <laughs> I do have an event. Sure. This is kind of like a sponsor. I have an event that's happening at Sammy's Camera in Los Angeles. Sure. This is actually a place that I've rented lights from before. Yeah, I've heard of them. I've never yeah. been out there. If you go down to LA, it's a good place to rent stuff from. Uh, Panasonic is sponsoring a workshop with me at a at like with Sammy's camera, sure. um, and it's it's on May twentieth. It'll be it'll be like a seven hour thing. It's like nine to five. <laughs> so I'm, if you, I'm sweating after like twenty minutes on <laughs> just talking into a mic, man. You're gonna be yeah. dead after that day. You're gonna need a lot of caffeine. Yeah. So if you want to spend the day with me doing a workshop uh, talking about equipment and documentary filmmaking, um, it's ninety nine dollars, which I feel like ah, a hundred dollars, but if you are interested in buying Panasonic Lumix stuff, my understanding is that that registration fee goes towards that. Yeah, and uh, if you're a legit business, that's a tax write-off. Yeah, you know, you add that into your. I've spent a hundred dollars or ninety-nine dollars going to an event that helps me in my career. Yeah, and also just so you know, not all of that money goes to me. I mean, I'm getting paid for the event, but it's sure. uh, it, you know, it's going towards Sammy's and, and right and the, the location and everything. Yeah, it's not a bad price though. I mean, if you're yeah. looking at a seven-hour workshop. Yeah. What else are you going to do? Be doing I mean, right now, my, uh, I think, let's see, I think my creative live class is about seven hours. It's long, yeah. And that's like $79. I haven't, I haven't watched the whole thing. Yeah. <laughs> but this thing, you can be in person. Yeah. That and that great. money can go towards lenses or, or cameras yeah. or something. Yeah. What are you going to be doing during this workshop? It'll be. It'll be kind of like Creative Live, uh, but I think it'll be a little bit more gear focused. Mm -hmm. Like, it'll be about documentary filmmaking. Cool. It'll be about how I shoot and light and mm -hmm. work on projects. Uh, with also a focus on the gear, right? And like, uh, you know, talking about some of the features I use on the Panasonic. Everyone get a free GH5 or anything like that? Or? You get a hundred dollars off. That's cool. Hey, a hundred bucks off. Yeah. That's like a half a lens in yeah. some cases, you know, <laughs> or a, a third of a hundred of a percent of like a cinema lens or something. Yeah. <laughs> 
All right, so we have some more questions that are not tax related. Sure. Who? Who? All right. <laughs> Finally passed the taxes. Yes. Those feds. So our first question today comes from Jerry, and he was just asking me what frame rate I shot Sriracha at. So mm -hmm. I told him it was 24. Yeah. I shot it at actually 23.98, yeah. the NTSC yeah. standard. Uh, because he was kind of wondering, like, does he have to shoot his film in 24? He kind of likes 30 because you get yeah. less... Motion blur, probably. Yeah, like less judder on pans. Right. Sure. I mean, you have more frames. You have less space between the frames yeah. for the brain to... to Process or yeah. whatever. Yeah, I... Uh, um, I'm not a big fan of 24 frames filming in it, at least. Yeah. And it's just my own personal thing. I probably get like strung up and, you know, on the internet. Film is 24. Yeah. <laughs> um, and it's just not, um, you know, my background and what I do is almost all commercial work. Yeah. Um, and there's just no need for me to film in 24 frames a second if I have to then deliver at 60 frames a second or 59.94i yeah. or whatever for broadcast. Uh, so I just don't do it. I, I do almost everything at 30. Occasionally I'll film at like 60. Yeah. Um, if I want a little bit of room to, to slow it down or, you know, even in a higher frame rate if I need to, but it's pretty rare. Yeah. Um, yeah, I got used to yeah. shooting TV and shooting at 30. For a while, I was doing 24, like right. when I was doing Indie Mogul, because mm -hmm. it is like the film frame rate. And also, I just thought, that's actually less frames that I have to render and upload. By what? what by a factor of it's almost a, a fifth less. It's 20% yeah. less frames. So, like, if you're doing tutorial frames? videos and they don't need to, like, have perfect... Yeah. Uh, persistence of vision between frames. Sure, yeah. You know, why not upload a few yeah, fewer I frames? I'll see gear reviews or something in like 60 frames a second, and I'm like, that's just got to be such a big file that you just yeah. uploaded to the internet <laughs> in dealing with a lot of processing yeah. speed. And um, But I think if you want to make a film in 30, that's fine. Yeah, like, I don't... go on TV nicely. Yeah, and there's no one, as far as I'm concerned, there's no one that needs to tell you how to do things. If you like the look of 30 and it if it lends itself to the subject matter, great. Uh, I mean, you might want to film in a really high shutter speed if there's a lot of movement or something and people will always, a lot of people will say 180 degree shutter speed or yeah. whatever, but if it works for your subject matter, I don't see what the problem is. Yeah. Um, and it's just, again, I don't, I don't typically do 24, but you do make a good point. Maybe I'll start, you know, <laughs> a little bit less, um, you know, some less, uh, um, processing. It's probably easier for the computer to play and, it back too. And that too, just you know, a little and, bit easier. um, so yeah, I just, I don't, and you've shot in, in you did, uh, Hand cut was, yeah, was 60, 60, right? Yeah. yeah. Did you notice a larger, a um, significantly larger file size? But I guess it would have been 4K too. Yeah. Right? Well, and what's always interesting to me is that uh, a lot of these codecs on the camera, you jump up to 4K, you jump up to 60p, and sometimes the bit rates are similar to the other yeah. modes. Like I think the bit rate in 60p might be the same bit rate in 30. Yeah. So it's actually recording the same amount of data. Just, <laughs> yeah, just <laughs> yeah. I guess half as much bit rate per, yeah. per frame. Uh, so the file sizes weren't always an issue, but mm -hmm. definitely having double the frames is requires more processing power yeah. to play it back. Yeah, um, and I so I just don't I typically don't shoot in a higher frame rate. And like yeah. I said, it's just my per my perspective yeah. on, on what to do with it. And I think Jerry was also wondering like, do you do you shoot and edit the same frame rates? And I told him, yeah, yeah. I think generally unless you're trying to over crank, under yeah. crank, do slow motion, mm -hmm. you should do match. It. Yeah. So you need to know what your output's going to be when you start a project and then shoot that way. Yeah, and that's, uh, so I mean, if I look at a, a, a client wants a golf course commercial and they, I know it's gonna go to broadcast, yeah. I have to, I wanna look at what Comcast or whatever cable company is gonna require me to submit it at and then I can work backwards from there so I don't have to do a lot of weird post-processing. Right. And, and I guess one thing with you and Nick, typically too, you would wanna match up your frame rates so one yeah. of you is not shooting at like 24, the other exactly. one's shooting at yeah, 30. Yeah, we're both shooting 30 for the podcast. So if you're trying to match footage from maybe a couple cameras, um, depending on what your project is, that might be another reason that you would want to shoot 24 over 30, you know, depending on what you're working with. Yeah. So we got another email from Jerry that I actually liked. Oh, um, Jerry, all Jerry right. just has great technical questions. Great. Um, so he was complaining that when he uploads stuff to Facebook, like to YouTube and, and sure. Vimeo, mm -hmm. it just looks worse than the stuff that he yeah. has on his computer. Um, but he says, so he, he uploaded a one minute sequence in ProRes 422 and it just didn't look good. And he was wondering why that might be, if he needs a higher bit rate or something. So my thinking is, when you upload a ProRes 422 file, this is mm -hmm. like, it's not uncompressed, but it's a really high quality yeah, file out yeah. of Apple computers, out of Final Cut. Uh, ProRes 422, you put that on Vimeo, but I think Vimeo is gonna take that file, transcode it down into H.264, yep. because that's what plays nicely on mm -hmm. the internet. Yeah. Uh, like. 
asking someone to try to stream a ProRes file is just asking to pull down a lot of data. Trouble. Yeah. And what client has a computer that can play like an uh, almost uncompressed yeah. f Apple or ProRes 422 file? Right. So I imagine that's part of the problem, that you're not actually seeing a ProRes 422 file when you're watching no. it on Vimeo. You're seeing what Vimeo has created out of that file. Yeah. And there's a lot of stuff on the internet. People throw fits about what YouTube and Facebook and Vimeo compressed. And I know for a long time, Vimeo kind of had the upper hand with maybe they had a more robust um, compression system. Um, I never export in that kind of high res. I do H.264 right out yeah. of the gate and then upload it and it's a quick upload. I don't have to worry about, I don't sit there and let watch the YouTube processing bar go across. Um, and I, you know, if you're looking at, that's like the least common denominator in the whole system. So if you're uploading a big high res file, it's gonna look the same as my lower res file when they both get transcoded yeah. into the same you know, resolution or, yeah. or kind of compression system or whatever. Yeah, so I don't so. think he needs like a, like a 10, 12 or 12 bit file. No. And in fact, he was wondering why hand cut looks so good. So I actually, you know, I create the thing as a ProRes file. In fact, sure. I, I think I exported a ProRes file right. for my own archive purposes. Mm -hmm. But then I take that ProRes file, put it in Adobe Media Encoder, and I made an H.264 file in 4K, mm -hmm. 60p. Uh, I think I set the bit rate to about 100 megabits per second. Yeah. Which might have been overkill, but I was thinking there's a lot of frames. There's yeah, it's 4K. Mm -hmm. I'm gonna give it a pretty high bit rate. That's what I uploaded to YouTube, so I think that worked pretty well. Yeah, um, and it does look good. Uh, and there are certain certain things I'll watch in 4K, and they just look beautiful. And other stuff I watch in 4K, and they just don't look as sharp or as crisp. And um, you know, I think it might just be in the workflow somewhere. Yeah. Um, and I mean, gosh, if I ever, I don't think I ever export above like 24. Megabits, you know, a second. Yeah. I, I have like the YouTube preset on my Adobe Media Encoder, and I've got a little higher bit rate of one, um, just so it goes into the system with a little bit of a higher bit rate, and uh, and then it just gets kind of compressed back down. Yeah. But yeah, I never, I never do a hundred because I figure right. some somewhere they're going to cram it into you know a smaller package. Yeah. At some point, it's kind of counterintuitive. It's like you you want to give the highest quality possible to Vimeo and YouTube, to so that when they when they transcode it, it's still high quality. Yeah. But I imagine there are some formats like 422 ProRes that you probably just don't want to send them because yeah. maybe they don't handle that very well. Yeah, I would imagine so. Um, and I don't know how it is with uh, Final Cut. It's been a few years since I've used it, but with Adobe Media Encoder, they've got pretty robust, um, a, a, a good list of, I want YouTube HD 720 or YouTube yeah. 4K 60P or something like that. And um, and it's they're up, you know, they're updated with some of the, um, you know, kind of updates with Creative Cloud. So, you know, if in a year there's like a new format or, you know, YouTube has changed their compression, they'll update that, you know, export setting, those export settings and, and you'll get it. So I just use those essentially. And then sometimes I'll bump the bit rate up a yeah. little bit, but it's not, again, it's easy. ProRes 422 seems a bit like overkill, uh, but good question, Jerry. So our next email is from Maxwell and he has a GH5 and one thing about the GH5 that some people have pointed out is that there's no way to like punch in, like zoom in to focus while you're recording. Oh, okay. Sure. You can do it on the camera before you record, mm -hmm. but while you're recording, it can't. And I've asked Panasonic about this, and they have explained the way the camera's engineered. There's just no way to like go fix that. It's yeah. just the way that it records video, it sure. can't do both. So there are some other ways to help focusing. Like there's focus peaking, which mm -hmm. are those little lines. Yep. I'm a big fan of that, actually. Yeah. Uh, but he's wondering, like, just generally, how do you focus on moving subjects if you're not using an external monitor, you can't punch in during the shot while you're recording. Like, what are some of your techniques for making sure things are in focus? Um, so that's a good question because I, I'm actually, I don't have that problem. <laughs> um, well, I, how do you do it? I use the Sony a7S II. Yeah, and, and it can punch in while? It can, yeah. I, you can zoom in, it's like a, a tenth of the screen. It's real. It's pretty. Yeah. It's pretty tight. Um, and you can adjust it however you want on the screen. So if I've got an off-centered face, yeah, I can select the view focus. Um, so during an interview, you can punch in, rack focus yep. a little bit manually, get it exactly. Yeah, right. exactly. Yeah. Um, I don't use it a ton. Uh, b you know, mostly because I just, you know, I'll get focus and then my subject's not moving typically. Yeah. Um, or if it is, I'm going to be wide. And you know a lot of stuff's going to be in focus. I'll yeah. be shooting at like five six or something, you know, yeah. um, f five six. And um, but normally what I would do is I like the focus peaking. Uh, the only downside of that is um, if you do have a longer or like a, a deeper depth of field. Um, I think the other day I was shooting at like f eleven. Yeah. Um, I you know my subject was peaked. You know, it had like the little outlines right. of the peaking. 
but when I went and looked at it after, I could tell like three feet behind him was the actual yeah. like critical focus point um, or like the center of it. Um, so I don't now I'm like worried that I'm relying on it too much and I'm getting lazy or something. Yeah. Uh, but the focus peaking I think is good. Um, and again, it's just doing it a lot, and knowing your gear. Yeah. Um, and I think people some I, I get the sense that some people are mystified by. Uh, by focus, like you need the camera to do autofocus and figure it out for you because it's yeah. like this very impossible thing to figure out on your mm -hmm. own. But focus is just distance. Yeah. So if I have a moving subject and they start in focus, because maybe I focus on them using the autofocus, like push to focus, yeah. I don't like to have autofocus during a shot. But if I focused on them at the beginning, and let's say they're running past the camera, if they're not changing their distance between me and them, yeah. they're going to still be in focus. By the end of it, yeah. So I often don't even focus on my subject. Sometimes I'll do things like focus on the ground before I do a shot, and I kind of know, like, n now that three and a half feet between me and the ground is in mm -hmm. focus. So as long as I stay three and a half feet between me and my subject, yeah. they'll be in focus. So I think that can help. And then, you know, if you see them move towards the camera, you know you're going to need to just move it a push bit. it a little bit. Yeah. yeah. And the, po the focus peaking helps. Yeah, and, I'm, um, and I've heard mixed reviews on it. I know not everyone likes it. Uh, and one of the other... Um, I I, can't, I just can't stand autofocus. I don't have yeah. that like I, it worries me that it's gonna right out or something like that. So I just never use it. Um, I mean, the camera doesn't know what you want in focus. No, not so at all. So it might it's, decide that wall behind your subject yeah, is the perfect thing to focus. Way on Way more right interesting, now. <laughs> you know. Um, yeah, I mean, like this could be focused on the camera equipment because there's lights coming, or you know, computer because yeah. there's lights coming from it. And yeah, right now are... I just switched this camera into manual that's filming us yeah. because I do not want it to change. It, we're shooting a long. 45 minute to an hour piece. Oh, yeah. There's plenty of opportunities for the camera to decide to focus on something else yeah. if I had continuous autofocus on. Yeah, and that those processing, the autofocus processing works pretty quick. So, I mean, it could be every yeah. couple of seconds even. And, and it I just gives me a lot of peace of mind yeah, yeah, to do it myself. Absolutely. And and as far as I'm concerned, like, I know what I want to see visually. The camera is just like the tool. I'm yeah. not going to, I'm not going to go, hey, camera, this is kind of what I want to see. Why don't you take it the rest of the way? No, I, <laughs> I'm going. I know everything about this. I, I know how you know what my focal distance is and some of that stuff. And um, there's no like magic bullet to determine exactly how far away or how to how to track focus, especially if you're getting a moving subject. But again, it's if you're doing narrative work, hopefully you can do it a few times and get it down. Um, and uh, yeah, I don't have a really good answer for that, frankly, other than just do it and know your equipment. I think is like yeah. the biggest thing is you know because I'll use a new lens sometimes and I'll focus the wrong way and then like the trees in the distance will get into focus and I'm like <laughs> you know and it'll look silly or something like that so just knowing it and, and being really comfortable with your gear I think is probably the best yeah in my opinion is the best bet that's great advice our final email today comes from Josh and he is trying to convince someone to be in a documentary his first major documentary that he uh, is working on so he's gonna sit down with this person and he's just wondering in that conversation how do you pitch the idea to someone that you want to make a documentary about them hmm and I had to do that with David Tran making Sriracha, yeah. and he said no at first. So, like, yeah. <laughs> it doesn't always work. Sure. I do think that people generally want to say yes. Mm -hmm. So you just have to give them the reasons to say yes. Yeah. I, I, you know, I've never had to approach someone in that regard. Um, typically, it's for a marketing piece, and I know the person, and yeah. I say, like, hey, I'm going to need someone to golf for me, or I'm going right. to need someone to, like, look into a telescope or a yeah. you know, stethoscope. Or if you're doing or a corporate job, like, yeah. the person who's hiring you can just force their employees yeah. to be in the video. Yeah, you're doing this. You're doing it. Um, but, uh, you know, and I've and I've come across this where uh, recently I, I, I bumped into a guy who hand carves wooden spoons. Mm -hmm. um, and he was just at the, um, like the, there's an activity center here in town for, you know, retired people. And um, he just sits there and he whittles it all the time. And I was like, oh, that's really neat. And he uses like these really minuscule little tools. Um, and I was like, oh, that, that might make like for a good kind of subject. And then in my mind, I'm like, I don't have a good enough focus to ask him to make a video yet. So I think that like, I th and I think you would need to have some sort of like, this is what I want to do yeah. to sell them on this full fledged idea, and not just, hey, you're kind of a cool guy. Let me film you a little bit yeah. and see what happens. That's going to creep someone out, yeah. and it's not going to give them the buy in. If you don't have the buy in, or if you don't have the like clear vision for what you want out of it. I think that that yeah. is probably a big hindrance. I think that's a great point that you need to help them visualize what this final product is going to be. Yeah. Because that is kind of what I do with almost everyone I put on camera. I usually, when I was doing news stuff, I would mm -hmm. very quickly have to convince people, like, I need to interview you now yeah. for 
a thing that's going to go on TV in two hours. Mm-hmm. So we don't have much time to talk about this, but I need to convince you that I'm cool, yeah. that I'm talented, that I'm going to make you look good. I think that was the most important thing, was just people have to believe that I'm going to make them look good. So yeah. I would just literally say that. I would say, look, I my whole thing sure. is I want to make you look as smart as possible mm-hmm. and good. Like, we're going to talk for five minutes, I'll interview you, but I'm only going to use the stuff that makes you look really good. Yeah, yeah. And Which is like 15 seconds of it, yeah. you know, for news. I forgot I used to do that for news, too. Yeah. And you got to convince someone in a very short time that, like, hey, I'll make you look good. I'm not a weirdo with a camera. Yeah. Well, I mean, I am a weirdo, and I had you have a camera, but, you know, this is for a legit operation. Yeah. And, and just being um, polite seems to convince people that, like, you're not that gotcha reporter that's yeah. like, I'm going to make you look like an idiot. Yeah, I'm not going to ask you about your taxes, you know, or something <laughs> like that. And yeah, I think, um, you know, being nice, being, you almost want to disarm them, but not in a malicious way or not in a deceiving way. Uh, I mean, but being just like a really nice, passionate person about what you want to accomplish, I think goes the furthest when, you know, you have to ask someone. Um, I mean, even if I'm going to ask my wife to like be a hand model for like, a, <laughs> you know, a shoot with food or something, um, I got to like butter her up and do it first. I can't just be like, get over here, give me your hands, you yeah. know, and then um, I think approaching it with, um, you know, honey gets you a little bit more. What's it? Honey gets you more bees than vinegar or something <laughs> right. like that. Or, I don't know. Um, whatever, whatever that saying is, yeah. use it. <laughs> I feel like you got it right, but it's a dumb saying. <laughs> it is. Yeah, I don't, I don't care for sayings much. You know, who's carrying vinegar around? Um, Old timey people <laughs> that sell snake oil or something. I have no clue. Um, I don't even know if I own vinegar at this point. <laughs> right. You know, I have a cabinet full of spices. I don't think I own vinegar to be honest. Um, but I think being nice and approaching people with that kind of um, I'm going to do everything I can to make this a good project, and I'm not going to, like, again, be the gotcha guy yeah. and, and do that as part of your best bet. I think that's what we have in common. Our video careers are built on us being nice guys. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, I know. I see people that do really well, and I'm like, man, that guy's a jerk. Why is he doing right. so well? And then I'm like, well, I'm nice. Yeah. yeah, I don't think you always have to be the best. I think if you're the nicest, sometimes sure. you get the job. Yeah, you know? um, yeah. I'm, I'm not really known as, like, the bad boy of video production. <laughs> That'd be cool, but... You know, I'm, <laughs> I'm the nice guy in town. <laughs> yeah. Well, n- that's what made you perfect for being on the podcast oh, today. Good. So I really appreciate you filling you know, like, in for Nick. Yeah. You know, I couldn't say no when you called me and <laughs> I was cleaning my bathroom. And I said, yeah, sure, Griffin, I'll be there in a few minutes. And I was really looking forward to having an opportunity just to hang out with you anyway. Yeah. I yeah. think I was going to see you on Thursday anyway. But, yeah, we've uh, got some sort of uh, alumni yeah, tasting we'll event of some sort. Alumni event. But yeah, I was really glad that we could just spend yeah, an hour hanging out. I agree. We should have done this like over lunch and you could just be a... <laughs> Yeah, hearing us chew or whatever yeah so next week i will be back with nick hopefully unless you want to come to vegas with me and do the uh, podcast you're again. gonna be out in nab aren't you yeah i'll yeah. be at the national association of broadcaster show yeah. uh and so nick and i will be talking about what's happening on the show floor there cool yeah that sounds like fun uh, i will pass but only because i have some projects <laughs> next week um and uh, but maybe you'll listen i will the... listen yeah I, I mean i listen every week so um this one i don't know if i'll listen to myself i don't really <laughs> I'm like my least favorite fan, so I don't, you know, I put a video and then I never watch it again. Yeah. Um, or if I do, I sit there and just take aggressive notes about how horrible everything is. So, <laughs> um, well, it was it was really fun. I really appreciate you giving me a call. And, yeah, yeah. And uh, and having me on and and let us uh, know in the YouTube comments how horrible Adam was. <laughs> yeah, please do. I'm happy to take criticism in any way, shape, or form. Um, you know, new haircut. If uh, you know, I, my wife tells me I slouch too much. So if I was slouching during it, whatever. <laughs> um, just let me know. Thanks. Take care, everyone. Bye. (laughs) (laughs) Perfect. Thank you. Hey, no problem, man. Not too uh, too shabby on time either.